Welcome to another episode of Distry. My name is Kirk from walrusgarth.com, and today we're going to be talking about things that we are thankful for. So welcome to this hodgepodge potluck of knowledge and fun. Uh, and with me, as always, is the one that brings the most sides, uh, <laughs> Kate the Disney Cicerone. Kate, how are we? Are we getting prepared to make all of Thanksgiving dinner? I know you do. Yes. Yeah. I almost got everything except for like the perishables. So I'm ready. I'm ready for Thanksgiving. <laughs> the perishables. <laughs> the perishables. I'm waiting until the last minute. A but partridge got my turkey. in a perishable tree. <laughs> but I'm excited for this episode because it's a little bit like a variety show. It's like we got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we don't have any idea what the other person's bringing to the table. Because This would be awesome this. if we had the same things. And then I would just go, listen to Kate. <laughs> I'll pull up pictures. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think we have the same thing. Well, who knows? Maybe we do. Yeah, Never yeah. know. That would be well, wild. But... I think. I think you need to start us off because okay. I, I'm. I'm bubbling with anticipation and excitement. I need to know <laughs> what. What does. What does the historical lady who has everything pick to be grateful for? Honestly, like I, I wrestled with this for so long because I was like, <laughs> do I want, do I want to do something like that? I'm truly like some of my favorite Disney history things, and I could have mm. gone that direction. Like, do I? But those are stories that I've told before, so I decided to do some things that I've been researching recently that mm. I'm thankful for for different reasons. So, the first one um, is that uh, it's I'm calling it pigeons of peace. <laughs> <laughs> What is this show? What are we doing here? <laughs> okay, well, this was actually triggered by um, you talking about Small World and how they did a, a Dove release at Small oh, World. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch yeah, of birds. birds. And I was like, come to think of it, I've seen a lot of birds released at Disney over the years. And so I was like, let me look into this a little bit deeper. And as it turns out, Walt Disney just was loved to do Dove releases for special events. However... They weren't actually doves. They were homing pigeons because uh, doves had a hard time like going back to where they were meant to go. Uh, but homing pigeons, that's kind of one of their their jam is to return back to their home, their loft, if you will, uh, from where they came. So uh, they're also four times bigger than ring neck doves. They're twice as large as the rats with wings pigeons that you would encounter in the city. So they, they, they they're big. Um, and they can find their home from more than a thousand miles away versus regular doves or pigeons. They have a distance of less than five miles. So they tend to get a little bit more lost um, and then they get a little confused. So <laughs> are you laughing already? Because <laughs> you're saying like they're not even good at what they do. They get lost. They're called homing pigeons. You would think they would know how to find their way. Well, no, the homing pigeons do, but the the regular pigeons and doves do not. So everybody oh. says, oh, they release doves at weddings and all these things. Well, most often than not, they're homing pigeons. And it, this is like became a thing for Walt Disney. Now, if you remember, Walt Disney loved animals, loved, loved, loved animals, um, which might be traced back to the fact that when he was a, a youngin <laughs> back on the farm in Marceline, he accidentally uh, <laughs> did in an owl and was heartbroken that he did that. So um, that is a possibility of one of the reasons he just had a, a compassion for animals. I have a quote from him that says, to protect birds and animals from the onslaught by the thoughtless elements of the population is not a matter of soft sentiment. Their careful preservation is now recognized as vital in the balance of nature under which our cultivated fields and gardens thrive and our healthful existence often depends. So one of the, the most famous, I think, Disney release of doves, quote unquote, homing pigeons, really, was July 17th, 1955. We actually see this during um, the opening day ceremonies, right after Walt Disney says uh, the dedication of Tomorrowland. Now, if you've ever seen this broadcast, Walt Disney actually like tri he he stops and stumbles because there is like a um, he thought that he got the signal to start talking and he thought he was live, but then he thought maybe I wasn't. And so he's like, oh, I thought I thought I saw it, but I didn't. But he actually was live. So you can go and see, well, does he kind of stumble through that a little bit? But uh, he says in this dedication of Tomorrowland, he says, a vista into a world of wondrous ideas, signifying man's achievements, a step into the future with predictions of constructive things to come. Tomorrow offers new frontiers in science, adventure, and ideals, the atomic age. 
the challenge of outer space and the hope for a peaceful and a unified world. And so then they release the doves out into the ether and uh, which are homing pigeons and Bob Cummings, one of the three hosts of opening day said the, those doves are, I hope the harbingers of peace for the world of tomorrow. So it was this idea of peace being associated with Tomorrowland. We ended up with these, with these birds. That wasn't the only pigeon release. So they're, they did it for evening flag retreat ceremonies back in 1965. They did this as part of Disneyland's 10th Centennial Celebration, and that was run by Neil McDermott, president of the California State Racing Pigeon Association. They also did it for Small World's opening in 1966, uh, Epcot's opening in 1982, the Lion King Celebration Parade. Does anybody remember that? I remember that. That is now, uh, they use those floats in Festival of the Lion King in uh, Animal Kingdom right now. So you can still go see the floats, but they used to have like a big dance number. And at the end of it, the birds would like be, they, they actually released birds at the end of the dance number, which was pretty cool. They, so Walt Disney became really interested in pigeon racing because of the opening day ceremonies. So now we're going down <laughs> the pigeon racing rabbit hole, if you will. Walt Disney started studying about it and talking about people in the industry uh, about pigeon racing. And he eventually partnered with director Walter Perkins of Perkins Films Incorporated to make a segment about pigeon racing for a weekly TV show. Of course, Walt Disney pre presents on ABC. Uh, it was in 1958. It was an episode called The Pigeon That Worked a Miracle, which uh, it, it's loosely based on a story called uh, Adapted from Pigeons Fly Home by Thomas Leggett, where basically a boy is confined to a wheelchair and uh, the doctors believe his paralysis is based solely on fear of him trying trying and failing to get up. Uh, it's all psychological, basically. And uh, so he uh, begins to train and raise pigeons. And when one is in peril, he gets out of his chair to save the pigeon. And that's that. That's the got story. him. <laughs> the Santa Barbara Adventure Racing Pigeon Combine built the loft and supplied the pigeons for that and then presented an award to Walt Disney, the National Pigeon Association Wendell Levi Outstanding Service Award for the greatest contribution ever made to the sport of pigeon racing for Walt mm -hmm. Disney. But then in 1958, brace yourself, because uh, Walt was asked to be chairman of the pageantry committee for the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley. So this is like Lake Tahoe area. He arranged a massive release of pigeons that was uh, 2,000 to 2,500 to be released during the opening ceremonies in partnership with the California State Pigeon Racing Organization. Um, <laughs> pigeons uh, were used to represent, of course, doves of peace. Uh, doves were not used because it was so cold and there was a huge snowstorm blowing through, so they were afraid that they were going to freeze and that would not exactly what you be what you want. <laughs> um, so once they released, they were spread out in different directions. Most, most of the Northern California birds made it home, but the Southern California birds didn't make it back to their loft till the next day. So this is like the pettiness is my favorite part of this here. He said, the Northern California pigeon owner was quoted to say, the Southern California pigeons were too fat to start off with. They're not as well trained as our birds. <laughs> So apparently there's like a, a rivalry between the Southern California and Northern California pigeon racing people. <laughs> well, I mean, if it, here's a fun fact. A Belgian racing pigeon fetched uh, $1.9 million. That's a record <laughs> price for the most expensive pigeon racing. Pigeon. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a thing. And so here's a picture from uh, is this a thing? the Olympics. Yeah. Well, it is. And so here's a picture from the Olympics of what it looked like. Disney did all of the pageantry for that, not just the pigeon part of this. Uh, and I also have a really fun picture of him and his wife, Lillian, chilling in the snow with one of his hats that she probably hated. Um, so with those Olympics, there was 25 trophies awarded to clubs participating. And uh, the tradition of re releasing doves always used to happen before the arrival of the Olympic flame. Now, it changed, though, in 1988 because this was in the Seoul Olympics. Some birds decided to perch on the the edge of the, the cauldron for where they light the, the Olympic torch, right? Light and, them up. Uh, they figured that the birds would just move 
when they lit it up. The, in fact, the birds did not move. And uh, they got a little toasty. <laughs> did they catch on fire? They did. And so they, they yeah, they were gone. <laughs> the doves of peace. So they decided to, from that point on, they would modify the tradition and not release them until after it was lit so they wouldn't perch on the, <laughs> the Olympic flames anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's a anyway. smart move. <laughs> um. So Walt Disney was awarded, uh, the, there was a Walt Disney trophy then that was awarded to the best flyers in California. Um, the first autographed version was given in 1960 by Walt Disney personally. And this is uh, races that ranged from 100 to 700 miles. So these birds would race. And there was like a huge application process to uh, get this award. You had to prove that your bird did all these various things. Um, so then How do I just you do that? How do you how do you prove that your bird know. did anything like and <laughs> literally anything besides like he's here you know like what do you how do you even qualify? Yeah, no, that's a great question. There's a good book on pigeon racing. It's at Amazon if you need to. Uh, it's called the Complete Pigeon Racing Guide. Uh, you need a new just copy. in case training, <laughs> record keeping, systems, feeding, health, training, everything. And oh my so, God, good lord, I don't. I know this is fine. This is fine, right? It's this is clearly a book, but it just looks like a guy is pinching pigeon heads. I know that's not <laughs> what he's doing, but it certainly it's looks like handling techniques. Probably he, he goes. It says racing pigeons advanced techniques. Yeah, it's like all right, you gotta put the beak in between your index and your ring finger. <laughs> um, How to so... train your pigeon? What is? Dude, this is what you're thankful for? Is okay, pigeon no, no, let racing? Let me finish. <laughs> let me finish. I'm not right, done. I'm going to stop talking. Okay, I have one last little portion. This is my longest one, just FYI. So, um, the, the I'm not thankful for the pigeons that roasted on the side of the. Thankful for the. <laughs> for turkey legs. We love turkey. a good turkey leg around. It's roasted bird. It just ties back into Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a dark place. <laughs> Moving on from that. Um, no, so there were uh, pigeons in the Magic Kingdom as well uh, that were resident pigeons to the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. So they were managed by Donald Brumfield uh, and his son also worked with him as well. And he raced pigeons on his own. So this was like his his thing was to race pigeons, but he also managed them for Magic Kingdom. <laughs> If you remember in the Merlin show that they used to have in front of the carousel uh, where they would try to pull the sword from the stone, if you're familiar with that one, uh, they did have birds in that show. So every morning, <laughs> Brumfield would take seven birds. Six, They had six shows, but they did seven birds just in case. They had an extra. Um, and put them in a small cage outside of Merlin's dressing room backstage. Merlin would pull a white pigeon from his carpet bag and release it to find the new temporary ruler of Fantasyland while King Arthur was away on other business. Of course, Merlin was chagrined when the bird flew away instead of helping the new, find the new ruler. Um, he didn't like that. So, But the bird, what? It was all part of the gag. So the bird would fly over Cinderella Castle and curve back to their lofts, which was behind the park, uh, behind Fantasyland. So, um, but what happened to the pigeons... <laughs> There's a lot of sad pigeon stories in this, actually. So in early 2000s, Disney World introduced hawks into the park to help minimize mice. Um, the hawks then learned the, the pigeon's flight path and their time of day that they would do this every single day. And uh, they, the local owls and hawks and falcons had kind of found them over the years, but not quite as as, as much as these new hawks. And so they, they just they started picking them off one by one. And it became a huge uh, problem because they realized that they were just they're just like sitting ducks. They would send them out and they would try to go home and then they, they wouldn't make it. So they discontinued using their pigeons in 2002. They sold off 260 surviving pigeons and they reassigned the cast members to other parts of the park. And then Donald Brumfield retired from Disney, but continued tending his own lofts. So 
Now, I want to say the reason I'm thankful for this story is because this was like a huge part of Disney's celebration. Every time they would have something to celebrate, the end of a parade, the beginning of a new um, event, a new ride, a new attraction, they would not only have balloons that they would release, but they would also release these homing pigeons. And so it was such an important part to um, Walt Disney was just loved it. And it was around. And I feel like not many people think about it or even know that it's a thing. So to me, it's like it really I'm thankful for what it symbolizes more than anything else, because that that's what made me think about this. The pigeons a piece, if you will, because I feel like there's it's such a you know turbulent time in our world. And it's really a good um, reminder of of peace. So that's that's mainly where I was going with that. Not in any it just took a weird turn. <laughs> that picture. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm thankful that you talked about pigeons so I could find these ludicrous pictures of people with pigeons. They're very serious about their pigeons, these people. Um, I the only fun fact I know about pigeons is like one of the coolest ones is this uh, losing bleeding heart pigeon. You can actually see him at I think Sue Tampa has him. They're really cool looking, but yeah, they've got like this little red patch on their chest. I don't know why, but yeah, pretty interesting. I think you can see the pigeons here, right here at the end of this is where they fly up from the opening day broadcast. Let me guess. They fly right into a ceiling fan and <laughs> half of them don't make it. No. I don't know, dude. This Nothing is what I know story. of. <laughs> pretty no. much every pigeon died in this thing you're grateful for like i honestly i i didn't like how the drones were chasing us so i'm glad they got rid of a couple of them no it's not what i meant it's like the, the fact that this was such a huge tradition in disney oh, no, and they kidding. used it for almost don't listen to me don't listen to me. what am i co-host of this thing <laughs> oh, i'm not helpful anyway already i do actually have i do I do have uh, something to add a value that is Disney related. Okay. So uh, <laughs> feed the birds, tuppence a bag. Tuppence is two pence. A pence is worth, you know, one one hundredth of a pound. So it's like two pence would be like two pennies. But in our currency or U.S. dollars, it'd be like closer to almost like three cents, three U.S. cents. So there you go. Feed the birds. Two and a half pennies a bag. Two and a half pennies. Two and a half pennies. The birds ate the balloons and died. No, they did Eat not. Eat the birds. <laughs> Walt loved seeing them die. <laughs> oh, kidding. no. He did. No, no. He really, he would race them. He thought it was good fun. Look, oh, look, there's another one who ate that one. <laughs> no. They have a latex allergy. That was before they used uh, different materials for balloons. Just can't. Can't let They're me mylar have the balloons. Pigeons of peace. <laughs> pigeons of peace. You lit them on fire, girl. <laughs> I didn't do those that. I didn't Disney bring this. ones. To be fair, those were just some Olympic ones that I thought was interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, mine's not going to be much better. I have human sacrifice in mind, so. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Oh, I'm what thankful. Do you think this would be. <laughs> the... I had no idea, and now I know more about you than I ever thought I would. And here, I thought I was the bird brain. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my goodness gracious. So, anyway, all right. What do you got, Kirk? I want to hear it. I I don't know if I can. How do you, How does one follow that? Yeah. <laughs> how do you top the pigeons? <laughs> I can't. I I don't think I can, to be honest with you. Okay, um... So I thought about things about this time period because uh, we started talking about gingerbread last week and then it brought me down a rabbit trail on gingerbread. But I also have another seasonal one and then I have a non-seasonal one. So uh, speaking of the holidays, we're going to talk about gingerbread and gingerbread houses and a little bit of origin about gingerbread because the history there is kind of interesting. Then what happens uh, with the structures before, after, all that good stuff. Uh, so gingerbread houses on property, and specifically, I'm going to talk about Walt Disney World. I didn't do anything with Disneyland. Y'all can figure that out. But <laughs> <laughs> mine had both. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. I we we love. Thank you for for doing that to us. Sorry. You know, like totally how kidding. we're supposed to 
we're supposed to hook people into this show and like get them to really <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh so gin- gingerbread house the very first one that ever gets put in Walt Disney World property is going to be at the Grand Floridian, but that's not all the way until 1999. So this is the 24th year here in 2023 that we've had a gingerbread house uh, built in the Grand Floridian. Now, before we get into the structure themselves and how do they build them, what are the materials, what happens to the breakdown afterwards, I have to give you a little bit of history about gingerbread because it's just Yay. is weird. It's very weird. History. And there is, there is Disney involved here as well. Um, but we have to go all the way back to um, the Romans. So we're, <laughs> Really? That far back? Yeah, I, we have to, yes. For gingerbread, you have to go all the way back uh, to the Romans. And I'm going to show you a, so ancient Rome. That <laughs> ginstery with Kirk. <laughs> what? Ginstery with Kirk. Gingerbread yeah, history. It's something, yeah. So uh, there's an ancient <laughs> Roman festival that happens for the god Saturn that's held on December 17th in the Julian calendar, Julius Caesar, and it goes all the way until December 23rd. Now, Saturnalia is uh, all about uh, sacrifice at the Temple of Saturn that happens in the Roman Forum. They have a giant banquet. There's lots of gift-giving continual partying mm. carnival atmosphere hello anybody think of any other holidays that are around december 17th to december 23rd uh so but during this time period they would no joke they would have actual sacrifices now uh, they would eventually <laughs> were they pigeons they were not pigeons they were people. <laughs> a ground uh, a, a giant but, it, but eventually but eventually it turns into uh, these Saturnalia biscuits, and these biscuits had uh, different various spices in them, and eventually uh, those biscuits would include flavors that came from Asia, and that flavor mainly being ginger. Um, now, once um, Roman Catholicism uh, and and Christianity starts uh, to unfold, so we're talking about uh, hundreds of years later, uh, we now remove. Uh, this this more Saturn versus Jesus, and uh, we are going to get a more of a bread structure. So, like instead of doing like these Saturnalia biscuits, uh, they're going to have spiced loaves of bread that have ginger in them. So that's where gingerbread and the term gingerbread comes from. Uh, but they would press these. And I actually have a picture of them. Yeah, da 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 da. In medieval times in these molds and so you would see these types of like really really ornate wooden presses that they would put the ginger bread so like this thick fatter bread and they would they would push it down and press it into things like the shape of the pope <laughs> oh my gosh and uh and and victorian and medieval folks as well uh, and queen elizabeth was known to be a huge fan of gingerbread and she would make her own characters and people for people that would like come over and visit her, particularly during these late December holiday celebrations. So, uh, <clears throat> we start with biscuits. <laughs> Could we care for a gingerbread pope? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we we start with uh, almost like a paganism Saturn biscuits. Then we go to Christianity gingerbread. Then we go to pressed gingerbread in molds. Uh, and then eventually the molds go away and it, it becomes simplified cutouts that people end up decorating themselves. But I think it's kind of interesting to the fact that like for the Temple of Saturn, they were literally sacrificing men and then gingerbread became like an edible sacrifice that turned into like it's the reason why we eat people. Is that weird? It is weird. Like, it's like a cannibalistic <laughs> weird sacrifice thing and it happens around December based on saturnalia's festival in late december i just think that's like it's wild to me that this even exists let's just like combine it with that what what we learned from our last episode of like hitting the pinata to like get out all of your seven deadly sins right right right. exactly (laughs) it's exactly right 100 percent. (laughs) so next up uh we're going to talk about gingerbread houses because okay how do we get from men or people and then go to actual buildings 
So the buildings and structures, it comes straight from the, Gr the brothers Grimm and Germany. And in 1812, part of the Grimm's fairy tale, you get the little stepbrother and little stepsister. Of course, we now know them as Hansel and Gretel, who get lured into the old witch's house, which is made of gingerbread and candies. And then uh, they try to, she tries to put them in the oven and they trick her and throw her in the oven, which is beautiful, lovely story. But there is some history that does involve uh, Walt Disney with the Silly Symphonies. This was back in 1932. Uh, they wrote a story that's called Babes in the Wood. Now, this is not anything that's rated X. This is a kid's silly <laughs> symphony. Such a weird name. <laughs> Babes in the Wood. Babes in the Woods. <laughs> I, would, I would never have gone there in my brain until you said right. that. And now I never As soon as I read it, I was it. like, what is this? This is like a horrible, <laughs> this is a terrible. Anyway, so the way the story goes for, for this version in Silly Symphony is there's a witch rock that starts singing and it recants the tales of Hansel and Gretel and the witch coming to take her away to their candy house. And I think I have a picture of Babes in Toyland. She's very scary looking. Very scary looking. This this whole silly symphony is really cool. You mean babes I mean, in, babes in the babe in the woods? Babes in the Yeah, woods. yeah. Babes in the wood, which is a part of the silly symphonies in nineteen thirty two. But you can see that she has either Struwafel or gingerbread for her roof and then she has candy cane pillars, but yeah, and the, but the, I don't know why, but for some reason they also run into dwarves that happens in this. I didn't actually watch the episode. I probably should have. Uh, <laughs> you but, didn't you know, watch the so episode. Dude, I don't have time for this. You know, uh, like, what are you going to do? Okay, there's always so much. That's your Thanksgiving assignment. Is to that's watch. my thing. All right, I'll watch it. Look, there's Witch Rock. It's a giant rock with a witch. Did we learn anything <laughs> from that? <laughs> 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 it's literally it looks like a witch. So, all right. <laughs> now we can start getting into uh, the gingerbread houses themselves, right? So gingerbread houses are not completely made of gingerbread. I know. Shocking. I'm sorry. And if you watched anybody's live streams of them building them or have watched content, they are structures made of wood in Walt Disney World. Uh, those wood structures get royal icing and then they they paste on top of them. And yeah, after that, um, after 1812 with Grimm Stories and in the early 1900s with the uh, lots of German immigrants coming over to the United States, that's why we started to actually make gingerbread houses. It's because of the witch who made gingerbread houses that people started making not only gingerbread men, but also gingerbread houses. And here we are in Walt Disney World using uh, 600 pounds of sugar, 800 pounds of flour, more than 10,000 individual pieces of gingerbread, thousands of eggs. It's crazy. The, I mean, the sheer amount of size for these things. So when yeah. they're, when they're actually constructing, you can see the wooden walls, especially on the bottom, right? And yeah, it is, it is Royal icing that they just paste onto the top to really make this beautiful, um, uh, gingerbread house they have always put even in the 1999 uh, they had always put hidden mickeys on it uh, there is sometimes a santa that is over 80 pounds of chocolate which is crazy uh, i didn't see santa this year but i think that's interesting that uh, some years they have and some years they don't i did see um for disneyland there was i just looked up like what are the what do the displays look like for this year? This has also become a tradition to open up like little small pop-up shops where they sell gingerbread and various treats. So this one is the Grand Californian, which I actually never stood, stepped foot in. I walked past it, but... You didn't go uh, in? No, 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 no. But this is crazy. This gingerbread house is a lot smaller than the Grand uh, Floridians, but the Grand... It is smaller. Yeah, the Grand Californians is only seven feet tall and 12 feet wide, 600 pounds of gingerbread, 600 pounds of powdered sugar, 250 pounds of fondant, gross, one pound of pixie dust, and <laughs> You're not a fondant uh, fan? features fond. I am not a Jane fondant fan. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, it's, it tastes like Play Doh. I don't know why. Interesting. We well, yeah. got to have marshmallow fondant. That's so much better. Oh, well, that sounds. Fondant. It sounds lovely. I I've never I've never had it, but it sounds good. 
So, oh, oh, it appears that this one does have a 85 pound chocolate Santa at the Grand Floridian here in Walt Disney World. And it spent over 500 hours baking the gingerbread, 480 hours spent decorating it. And uh, there are 24 hidden Mickeys on it this year. And there's always like little scenes um, within each part, which is cool. You showed the, did you show the um, Haunted Mansion Holiday, which is also has yeah. an overlay with, uh, gingerbread as well this display does actually have gingerbread in it it is not just fake this uses 300 pounds of gingerbread and it takes over 20 days and 13 cast members uh, to create it and i love that there is a gingerbread scent in haunted mansion holiday which i think is also really cool we've had two additions to this year um this is a previous picture uh from last year's where they would always do a carousel at the beach club and this has been going on, which is crazy to me, almost as long as the gingerbread tradition. It's only two years later that the Beach Club got a life-size carousel that moves. And again, this is a wooden structure with metal underpinnings. Uh, but this gets gingerbread over top of it. And they have done many years where it is uh, princesses. Uh, last year it had Tiana was a horse. Uh, same with... Um, I think they had one for uh, Princess Anna as well. This year it is DuckTales, and it is all themed towards the World Showcase. Um, what do you call it? I have I have videos on. I'll pull it up in a little bit. <clears throat> and then we also get one over at the Boardwalk. And then the big big addition from last year is that they added a gingerbread giraffe to Disney's Animal Kingdom. And this year we got a, so it's a life-size baby giraffe. And then we got a life-size baby zebra this year because there was a couple of new zebra. And they're made out of gingerbread sugar dough and modeling chocolate. And that giraffe is nearly seven feet tall. And then the last gingerbread house neat. on property. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Last uh, gingerbread house on property is over at the Contemporary. And this one is a castle. And it's celebrating, you would like this because it's Mary Blair inspired. Yeah. Uh, celebrating the 100th with a Mary Blair style. And there is a ornament for a five-legged legged goat, which she did the murals for the oh, contemporary. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. And this one is seven feet, 17 feet tall, 612 pounds of sugar, 1,012 pounds of flour, 112 pounds of gingerbread spice, and over 4,000 castle gingerbread bricks and 12 sprinklings of magic pixie dust and there's 12 hidden five-legged goats that you can go that's fun we're definitely going to do a day where uh we go and live stream and go check out all the gingerbread houses and go try out gingerbread i also did learn that there is a difference between the gingerbread at most of the gingerbread houses uh if you go to the grand floridian it's more like bread it's it's bigger it's thicker and it's more spice forward with less sugar that's austrian and if you go to the beach club it's more german uh, which has like a, a glaze on top of it, almost like a, like a glazed pfeffer noose. Really, really good. Still spiced, but more of a chew. And that's there's another thing that happens uh, to gingerbread, and this, this happens in the States. Gingerbread for the longest time was made out of sugar. And it wasn't until uh, the World Wars where there was a reduction of usage of sugar as sugar was going and, and used for war efforts that molasses was being pushed. And molasses gets introduced uh, to gingerbread, which actually makes them darker, more robust, and then chewier in texture. So molasses is a big part of that as well. I do have a note here from Joey. It says that Disney takes them apart, the gingerbread houses, and brings it to a bee reserve after so the bees have a sugar. Yeah, thanks, Joey. I was getting there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you, Joey. I am getting there. I, that's actually, you, store, you took it right out of my mouth. But it's true. Joey is correct. Uh, they um, there's there's lots of declining bee populations across the world, and this actually is a is an interesting story. What they used to do is go in with like paint scrapers, and they would scrape all of the shingles off of the gingerbread houses, which, so there would just be nothing but royal icing left behind. And they would take all of the uh, the big materials, which they still do. And grind them up and they use them for compost to local farmers. Sometimes they go to tree farms. Sometimes they go to produce. Sometimes they go to animal farms. Everything's just local in the Florida area. But uh, when they were power washing 
the siding to get rid of the sugar, they noticed that uh, it was really annoying to clean because bees would just come swarming in uh, because bees love to have sugar, sugar water, and then they could actually cross-pollinate a lot of these gardens. So instead of just like trying to hose them down and like fight the bees, they decided to, to move the actual, um, after they remove all the shingles, uh, take the sugar-fied structure and move it to an actual farm that's local or a garden area that's local. And then they hose them down and then the bees actually naturally clean it. And then they will bring them back and finish the rest up with some uh, a hot power wash bath. And they are clean, put in storage, and they're good to go for next year uh, when they create the new ones. But yeah, I, I do have a... This is Walt Disney World officials said, with bee populations declining around the world, Disney has made it in their mission to provide pollinators with even more habitat and resources through pollinator-friendly gardens across the property. So they they obviously have increased the amount of gardens. Um, and the chief pastry chef, Christine Farmer, who's been leading the project for the past 23 years, said the gingerbread house has become a second life Helping bees is a happy accident. Hmm. So, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, it's, I love that they, they uh, use the materials as composting. So it's getting, nothing is getting wasted. And then the fact that bees are getting a little bit of uh, some sweetness, you know? Oh, I love that. Yeah. I did have someone ask, uh, did you see the new gingerbread lighthouse at the Yacht Club? Yes, yeah, so that's a new addition. I have not physically seen it, but it is a, uh, I forget what scale it is, but it is a direct replica of the lighthouse that's outside of the Yacht Club. They still have the train station up, and it is a 12-foot lighthouse. So what made you choose the gingerbread story as one of your... Um, because I already before. knew a little bit of the history of gingerbread and I just thought about it last week and I was like, you know what? It's, it's got this fun tie in with the silly symphonies. It's got a fun tie in with obviously all the gingerbread properties on, uh, Walt Disney world property. And I just think it's, it's, it's something that it's, it's unique and different and makes it. It makes it different than other places because theme parks have lots of different structures when I was at IAPA this week, I saw lots of fake or resin or these these like beautifully detailed things. But this is like a physical thing that has a very long tradition in Walt Disney World. I mean, we're on our 24th year of the gingerbread house at the uh, Grand Floridian, and we're on our 22nd year of the carousel. I think that's just I I honestly I thought the carousel was like five years ago. I had yeah. no idea. That it went back such a long tradition at the resorts. And I, I also think it's just like a fun, interesting thing to talk about all the little nuances. Like they they tell that bee story in a very small way. Um, if you look at like the backside of one of the displays, but most people don't. So I, I remember reading that last year and I was like, that's a, just like a funny little interesting thing. Because most people just go, oh, that's pretty. That's nice. They eat their snacks and they move on. Um, but not me. <laughs> No, you lingered. Remember how you watched the carousel being built, waiting for it to come on for like, I don't know, was it an hour or two? And then you were like, but it was so cool when you're standing there because you watch all the little kids put all the hidden Mickeys on it. Oh, yeah, it I, I had no play. idea that they allowed guests to create the hidden Mickeys. What was interesting, too, is the cast member had a tablet. So every time a could, uh, kid took uh, it was it was like edible gold leaf. They would they would press it into the edible gold leaf and they would press the Mickey on. And then she would write the exact location and she was keeping track of like how many and where they were at just so in the future, if they, they probably have 24 hidden, I'm assuming for, or 22 hidden for 22 years, something to that effect. Cause there's 24 hidden on the Grand Floridian one, which would make sense for the anniversary of 24 years. All right. So let's do gingerbread story. Are we and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Um, so my second story has to, I don't have a cute name for this one. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a little fishy. It's a fishy story. It's a fishy story. <laughs> We're from pigeons to fish. <laughs> um, so it's actually about fishing in Disneyland because a lot of people asked me about this when I just kind of gave a little brief post about it. Um, so 
fishing in Disneyland was a thing back in 1956, June uh, 16th, 1956, when Tom Sawyer Island opened. They added a place to go fishing, which actually comes from uh, Knott's Berry Farm. They had fishing over there in Knott's Berry Farm, and they decided they were going to do that too in Disneyland. That was very common for Walt Disney to do that. Um, so they only, they stopped, they basically took a part of the rivers of America and they had two fishing piers that had 25 like bamboo poles each. And around that fishing pier, they kind of netted off that part of the river. And then they stocked it with uh, river perch, bluegill, catfish, uh, trout. They just a whole bunch of kinds of fish, but they couldn't go anywhere else in the river. So it wasn't like everywhere in the river. We still do have fish in the rivers of America. So that's, that's still a thing today, but it was specifically in this area. And this whole area was called Catfish Cove. So um, it's if you were there today, if you're like standing kind of near the dock for the Mark Twain, it's like opposite of that. So if you're kind of putting it in perspective of where it is, um, I do have some pictures of it as well um, for this is what the fishing docks looked like. So they had the, the fishing poles and then they had worms for bait that they put in little cans around there, which basically they put topsoil in the cans and then they would add the worms to them. So I will just also give a little context. Some people don't know that there's actually four parts of the river of rivers of America. There's Mississippi, the Columbia, the Potomac and the Rio Grande. So there's four. As you sail around, you sail to four different rivers of America. And that's why we have that name. Uh, but anyway, when it comes to fishing, you would pay for the use of your pole, and then you would pull fish out of the ground. Now, this really interesting... Uh, the ground. The ground. ground. The water. Sorry. Not the ground. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> it's not that funny. I just am <sighs> tired. <laughs> oh my goodness. I said the wrong thing. I'm sorry. I do have a picture of the original, um, the tackle shack, but it was for... <laughs> <laughs> Tom Sawyer Island looked like this. It it was later converted into a restaurant when there was no longer a tackle shack. So um, if you see that today, I have this really cool. Um, they used to have before they would open parks in Disneyland or like a new land in Disneyland, they would show you with a storybook, like what was coming into that land. So they have one for Tom Sawyer Island. And I believe number 17 on this list, which I'll zoom in a little bit was they called it um, the bait and tackle for fishing. So it's like right, if you look where this little waterfall is, it's right underneath the waterfall and kind of near the shack. So that is where the fishing shack was. So I will say that before I get to like what, what you did with your fish, because that's, that, that's probably my favorite part of the story. Uh, I will say that <laughs> there was... <laughs> Come on. I'm trying to talk about fish. <laughs> so You plant opened... the fish in the ground. <laughs> so opening day of 1956. I'm gonna just move on. Uh we did you do see Walt Disney fishing <laughs> with um Becky and Tom Sawyer, Becky Thatcher and Tom Sawyer. And now these are publicity shots of the winners of the annual Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher contest in Hannibal, Missouri, This was, which was Mark Twain's hometown. So, however, though, there was going to be um, a resident Tom Sawyer, though Walt Disney was a little bit unsure about having him. This is where our person named Tom Nabb comes in because he looked a lot like Tom Sawyer. He was actually someone who sold a whole bunch of new newspapers inside the park and he everybody told him he looked like tom sawyer and so his mom was like you look like tom sawyer you should ask walt disney for a job being tom sawyer and so he kept like seeking him out and uh he was like you should hire me to be tom sawyer and walt disney would always say i'll think about it i'll think about it because you remember at this time walt didn't have the main characters in the attraction because you were supposed to be the main character right so they would make sense for him not to have that but eventually he must have convinced him because I have this quote from Tom Nab that says, so I think I convinced him into hiring Tom Sawyer. So he said he'd think about it. And so for almost the next year, anytime I could find Walt and ask him if he was still thinking about hiring me as Tom Sawyer, 
I remember one conversation that we had, he told me he could probably put a dummy or mannequin, I think it was a mannequin, over on the island that wouldn't be leaving every five minutes for a hamburger or a hot dog or a Coke. <laughs> He's like, kid, listen, here's what he looks like, by the way. This is a this is Tom Nav as Tom Sawyer on the island. He um, reminds me of the kid from, did you ever see Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, the 3D? Yes make and it's like the kid who is the sardine kid or whatever that's what yes. it looks like he looks like yes. the sardine kid coupled He's... with the pirate that has dirty feet yeah so he has rolled up jeans and bare feet and a straw hat and a, a plaid shirt and uh so one day dick nunes tapped him on the shoulder <laughs> and he thought he was going to kick him out of the park so um, he said, he usually accuses me of sneaking in. I didn't sneak in, but I got down there legally. So I'm walking with uh, Dick and we're going over to Frontierland. And this is when the chicken plantation was still there in, in the Indian village. And I walked over this little bridge and uh, and Walt and Morgan Evans and Bill Evans, the landscaped architect for Disneyland and Walt Disney World were coming off the island on the route. And Walt said when he got to the dock, he said, it's obvious you still want to be Tom Sawyer. And I said, absolutely, Mr. Disney, I do. And he says, well, super. You need to get down a work permit and your social security card. And I said, OK. And then he says, once you do that, I'll put you to work as Tom Sawyer. So they had him bring in his report card and he had to uh, show them that he had to maintain a C average or he wouldn't be employed anymore because he was still a kid at this point. I think he was 12 when he got hired to be Tom Sawyer on the island. So this is this is him chilling and uh, hanging out. And so what he did on here was he posed for a lot of pictures. He baited a lot of fishing hooks and repaired a lot of fishing bolts in the fishing spot. And uh, he was either Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn, whatever guests wanted him to be. He would just kind of play both. And he also would clean the fish and put them in plastic bags. <laughs> so one of his jobs, that's him as well with Walt Disney that you're showing there. So you know, guests would catch the fish and uh, they would want to take them home with them. So he would clean the fish um, and put them in a bag or sometimes they would take, if he wasn't there, they would take the fish over to the Aunt Jemima Pancake House, which is now the River, Be River Bell Terrace, and they would clean the fish and then they would refrigerate it and you could pick it up on your way out of the park. However, not everybody took their fish to be refrigerated. So some people would take their fish that they caught and then they would carry it around with them, sometimes onto rides and sometimes uh, put in trash cans when they got tired of holding onto it. And they would sometimes leave it on a ride by accident. So pretty quickly, the entire park started to smell like old fish. <laughs> so... um. Of course, this was not exactly in line with Walt Disney's vision of having a clean, sanitary park. Yeah, do you, uh, you know, do you think, uh, at what point do you think it really tipped the scales for Walt? <laughs> he probably encountered one of them. It's like, what is that? <laughs> um, So this was, so it opened in June of 1956, and the catch and carry home um, catch and take home only lasted until August. So it was literally just like eight weeks. And then they were like, we can't do this because there's going to be, there's just the whole park smells like fish. <laughs> so what they did was they, they did, they did keep the fishing around, but they debarbed all the hooks. So they made it instead of a, a catch and, and carry, they did a catch and release program instead. So people could still fish for quite some time in uh, the rivers of America on these two fishing docks. and But they, uh, until 1965 is when they discontinued the use of fishing poles and fishing in the parks. Um, I also mentioned just along the lines of uh, Tom Sawyer also around that time was discontinued as a character. Um, and But we never had an official Becky character. They only had that one for publicity and opening day. But Tom Sawyer was the only one that we had uh, because he was, he looked so much like him and he bugged Walt so much. So that is my fishy story in Disneyland. <laughs> That's, uh, I think Walt <laughs> captures our, <laughs> do tell more. I thought it's a fun story. Like how many people know about the fishing? No, I like that. I like that. And 
you can you can still fish over at the uh, Seven Seas Lagoon. So if you want to go fish, it's it's always by the reeds. There's always like reeds by the islands. That's where they always take them. They love the reeds. Yeah, I don't know. Every time I'm on the ferry, especially in the morning at like seven o'clock, there will always be a fishing charter there. All the time, all the time, people are catching fish. Big old bass too. They're like. My guess is they don't take them into the park then, though, for the day and hang out with their fish. I, I don't <laughs> on, know. I think they, I think they go would. on Big Thunder Mountain. Wouldn't you? With their fish. <laughs> go for a spin of the teacups with your fish. I think that's a challenge. <laughs> I think one day we should just walk around with fish all day. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm good skipping that challenge. If they were fake fish, I could do it. I would get on board, but not like real fish in the Florida heat. Like, no, thank you. Ah, uh, dude, it's, they'll be fine. <laughs> Alrighty. Are we ready for your story? Next story. I'm ready. Yeah. The fish trick. <laughs> um, I'm such a sicko and I'm not going to go too crazy into this, but I want all hail Michael Eisner. I'm not oh, going to do no. the whole Eisner thing. You oh, look how upset. But I am going to talk about Michael Eisner right now. And we're going to talk about things that I'm thankful for when I was a little baby going to Disneyland. So Disney World had one of the scariest rides ever. Although I, I still would question as to, is this the scariest ride? Uh, the al- extraterrestrial alien encounter? Or was the scariest ride over uh, seas uh, the... What is that? That black cauldron one seemed to be very scary too. Uh, I, but I still say Snow White Scary Adventures is still high up there for it was, most terrifying. Right? Wasn't as scary as this though. I'll tell you that. Uh, this that's this true. was intense. It was really. This really one bad. made me like claustrophobic. It made a lot of people cry. <laughs> <laughs> it made me excited and buy a stuffed animal. So if that tells you anything about what kind of kid I was, I was like. That was amazing. We need to go again. And everybody else is like, <laughs> so let's talk. We're getting little a little bit. bit of insight into Kirk and who he is and yeah. how he came to be. I am a sicko and I have problems. And part of that <laughs> is thanks to Michael Eisner. So right back at you, Mikey. More reasons to be mm-hmm. a fan of there Eisner. There mm-hmm. So uh, for a lot of people, if you don't know, This was an attraction that was based in Tomorrowland uh, in Walt Disney World in the Magic Kingdom. But let's let's set things up just a little bit. Let's set things up a little bit, right? So Walt Disney World opens in 71. There's some leadership changeover, 1984. Frank Wells and Michael Eisner take over as president and chairman of Walt Disney World Productions. Their goal is to make Disney's core business focused on live action and animated studios. This is the start of the Renaissance, right? Then in the 80s, with all the success of the films, this is where we get a lot of innovation in the theme parks, right? So the theme parks start to get modernized. They're emphasizing thrills, excitement, pop culture. Uh, also think like things like Pleasure Islands get introduced. Things that like kind of like more adult up the attractions. That was basically me. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'll get this. I'll get this angle right. So in the 1980s, you're getting more of an influence from some of the sci-fi stuff, particularly uh, George Lucas. Uh, We're getting a collaboration with Captain EO and then Star Tours. So there's a shift of incorporating more external Uh, properties and IP and storytelling in the Disney parks. This is in the 1980s. So, and in that same exact time period, with the success of Star Wars in 1977, uh, and then in 1979, the movie Alien, which is a horror sci-fi film, becomes a defining moment in the genre, showcasing darker, more intense vision of the future. It's really like... and. (laughs) And even, even so much, those that like the great movie ride, you remember that they actually incorporated the alien property in the great movie ride. So making things, and then that was at MGM. Um, so we now are moving a little bit further ahead. We're getting into the, the 90s. And the problem with Tomorrowland 
is it's not staying up to date or feeling as futuristic. So they, they want something that seems to bring in far-fetched technologies and move them into Tomorrowland. But there's also a competition with a major thrill ride and movie producer that has their own theme park here in Orlando, Florida, Universal Studios. So to be more appealing, uh, because Magic Kingdom was seen as below teenagers families uh kids once they started getting to 13 14 15 16 17 18 disney was too like young kid so for to to brighten it up and make it a little bit more lively uh michael eisner introduced the idea of alien encounter so uh alien encounter is a uh there's a mysterious alien mega corporation and I'm not going to go too far in depth in this, uh, but they basically create a technology that allows teleportation. So they're going to be able to move one being from another area. And they show this one alien Skippy that's really friendly, and they're going to move that Skippy all the way to another one. And then later on in the attraction, they're going to move a very friendly alien and move him in. Now, interestingly enough that you're pulling up that uh, there's a survey that they did they did an exit poll of people when they were trying to figure out what IP to actually use in Tomorrowland. Uh, and they did an exit poll and close to like 75% of people had heard of the film or seen the film Alien. So originally they were going to use um, that as their intellectual property, uh, but there were some licensing issues. So instead of doing that, they developed their own which it's their own mock-up of what a xenomorph would be, which is exactly like the aliens from Alien. Uh, and this company, XS Tech, uh, seizes the future by bringing in an alien. And this was very immersive. You would sit in these seats. The alien would stalk you. It would breathe and lick on your neck. And no. it would eat a guy. It no. ate a guy. It was no. crazy. It was super scary. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> everybody despised it. They dumbed it down and made it stitch, and it was terrible. Oh uh, gosh. Everyone was scared. I was scared when it was stitched. I loved it. <laughs> I had seen it so many times as a kid. I forced my parents to take me on it a lot of times, and I still have that stuffed animal. And I am thankful and wish that we had more thrilling and exciting experiences in the Disney parks Michael Eisner was an innovator and all hail Michael Eisner. Oh, gosh. No. <laughs> I'll be thankful when I don't have to hear you say that again. Just saying. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to go too far in depth on the actual ride because yeah, I, it's on my list of one to three episodes to do extra terrestrial The Alien Encounter. Well, it's interesting that like we've gotten so far out from that ride that there's a fair amount of people, especially if they didn't frequent Walt Disney World, that they don't even know that that ever. Existed. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. So. I don't think most. Yeah, we're at that point. I mean, I was born in '84, right? And this uh, this came around in I think it was like '96 ish. It was in the mid '90s, right? But I mean, it it's literally there was a center column, and that's where most of the story would take place. And then these video screens and guests would sit in seats that had harnesses and the harnesses had all of those special effects. So think in the exact same time period as they did like Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. So like similar technologies there that would make you like feel like the snake or the hamster moving by you, all those kind of things. Similarly here, but with a giant alien who's trying to eat you and it goes dark. Like sometimes they just shut all the lights down and, uh, it's terrifying. it's really cool. At what yeah, at one point there's a guy who's above you on a scaffolding and you you uh can see his video screen and you can hear him like clomping around and see his flashlight on the fuse box to like fix it and he does not fix it. Uh Rhonda says it was created June 1995, closed October 2003. Thanks for looking at yeah. the dates for us, Rhonda. I hate that it's gone and everyone was so, so scared. There was at one point like this column was uh, concealing and holding in the alien. And you're like, oh, okay, we're safe, right? And it, like even the mayor of excess or the, I don't know if it's the mayor or Martian or if he's the leader. It's been a long time since I've uh, experienced the attraction. But yeah, it was, uh, he's like, it's fine. That glass can't be broken. And then like three seconds later, the glass breaks and then the lights go out. And you're like, <laughs> That's it's like so a good. no for me. No thanks. Oh, so look good. at this dude. He gets it. See, 
so while I only went on it, I never went on this version of it, but I went on it when it was stitched. And I remember those shoulder harnesses that they like almost like push down on your shoulders. And it's as if you're getting in a, uh, like a roller coaster that's going to go upside down. That's the kind of harness that yeah. it is similar to that. But to me, it created this sense of like claustrophobia that I couldn't escape if I needed to. Oh, yeah. That that was what built so much like fear was that I was stuck in my seat and I could not get out. And so, and it did hurt yeah. too. They would push the, it down pretty And the far. purpose, <laughs> the purpose of these harnesses were there were sensors, there were speakers, and there was also like water jets or air so that they could use these effects. And the reason why they did the harnesses was because everyone has different heights. So if, um, and I remember I actually went on it once and like my shoulders were up a little too high and then all the effects were like hitting like the top part of my head and not sequenced correctly. <laughs> so the reason for these was just because they weren't angled um, so that they, they, they was more encompassing and closer. Yeah, I like this one part. Spinlock is the gentleman who uh, runs Excess. People of Earth, listen, please do not scream. And then right after that, boom, the alien bangs his head and then all the lights go out. <laughs> and then you, so and you you could hear like the alien breathing on your neck, like and it would be like No. No. I can't. Oh, it was so it was great, oh, and I loved it. I loved no. it. It was like stepping into a horror movie. So I'm, I'm thankful. Okay for that. that one's gone. I'm just saying. I'm okay with that. Not me. <laughs> I don't like it. I mean, it'd be okay if it came back for people like you that would enjoy it. I just wouldn't go on it. That's fine. Yeah, it was it was great. I loved it. It was so much fun. And it was so scary. Again, you don't really get scared there. You know? I mean, I guess I don't really get scared at Universal either, but like there's I mean, I guess HHN or whatever, but that's not the same. <laughs> it's not really the same, right? Like those Something are like haunted broken houses. In you, Kirk. Something is so broken. <laughs> It's it's not. What was that Walt Disney <laughs> Walt Disney said it's everyone wants to be scared, but they yeah. want to be scared in a safe environment. Safe place. It's like it's Yeah. Safe. That's why I love the Haunted Mansion. Like when I was a kid, I was freaked out about it, but I really enjoyed it. And it's, it was creepy and odd, but it it's gives you a a feeling of excitement and thrill, but knowing that you're completely comfortable and safe. Yeah. You know? I'm just giving you a hard time. I think it's I think it's fun. No, no. Listen, some people like birds and fish and other people <laughs> like uh, murderous aliens and gingerbread where there's cannibals. You know, do you? Well, are you ready for my third story? Yeah, third let's do final it. Final story. Yeah. This one is this one is not so much a cohesive story so much as a little collection of haunted mansion things. Since we are talking about uh, scary things, let's let's just mosey on over to the haunted mansion, shall we? Yes. Um, of course, we did that super long 16 episode series at the Haunted Mansion. And since then, I have still found multiple things that we didn't cover in that series. Shocker. So I have um, a quote from Walt Disney, or at least a, a way that he talked about the Haunted Mansion before it was actually opened. That's actually, I found it very interesting. So this was Walt referencing the Haunted Mansion ghosts on the BBC interview. And this was according to like John Hedges retelling this interview. He said he used the opportunity while he was on the air to invite them, the disenfranchised ghosts. He said they have plenty of them in England and their old houses were torn down and they'd have no place to go. And he wanted these ghosts to come to California. He said some other surprising things. He said ghosts really need a place. They need to perform for a certain length of time, and they needed to pay for their crime by going through it so many times, and they needed an audience. Ghosts actually require an audience, and he guaranteed them the best audience in the whole world right here at Disneyland. Which I thought was a really interesting way of him thinking about it, because we've always talked about how the ghosts were like famous ghosts, right? That they invited the famous ghosts to stay or retired ghosts. But this is really like the ghosts that need to like repeat the same things over and over again. Also, I don't know if that's poltergeist or like I'm not up on my ghost knowledge, but like <laughs> the ghosts that like have like a story that they have to tell over and over again, like forever. You know what I, I'm talking about? Um, So that's interesting way of thinking about it that like well they have to they have to keep like reliving this story and doing the same thing they might as well do it at Disneyland where they have a great audience for it so he said uh John Hench said it was really a quite a clever way of talking about what he wanted to do he was 
explaining a place that could house a great number of ghosts. I think most haunted houses have one or two and that's it. But Walt thought that ghosts would do well together. So they could all come in the same house and hang out together versus just like one ghost. So penitent and ghosts. Okay. Thank you for that. So, um, so that was just kind of an interesting way of Walt Disney talking about ghosts in general. So that was just one of my little pieces of Haunted Mansion. Um, and then I had, of course, the note that was posted outside of the Haunted Mansion, which we've talked about, that talks about um, post-lifetime leases are now available in the Haunted Mansion. Um, that, and so this says, notice all ghosts and restless spirits post-lifetime leases are now available in this Haunted Mansion. For reservations, send resume of past experience to Ghost Relations Department. Disneyland, please do not apply in person. Now... Marty Sklar said this about the ghost. So we said, we heard Walt Disney. This is what Marty Sklar said and wrote about the ghost. He said, Disneyland's will not live in a ghost town. They will occupy a deluxe haunted mansion. Here, the lonely ghost who seeks the companionship of 1001 restless spirits can live in a domain of illusion and imagination. There will be spine tingling built-ins that are sure to provide new life for even the most sagging spirits. Fresh cobwebs daily, wall-to-wall -wall creaking floors, stereophonic screams, cold drafts, and midnight lighting all day long, plus an endless supply of guests on whom the inventive spooks can practice individual talents from simple scares to supernatural shockers. So I thought it was really a really fun idea of like, here's the amenities you can expect in this haunted mansion. Fresh cobwebs, wall-to-wall -wall creaking floors. <laughs> it's like, I thought it was a really fun way of, of talking about it. Um... They love those things, so I'm I'm in. Yeah, uh, so the original number of ghosts, if you picked up in there, would have been one thousand and one, um, and this is actually something you see if you go on a tour of Walt Disney's office. Um, in his informal office, he had two offices in Walt Disney Studios. He had the formal office and then the informal where he worked most of the time. So he has up this map from, this is from 1966. Um, they haven't really changed it from his office that shows kind of like projects they just completed or are working on in Disneyland. And if you go to the left side of the map and you look in really closely, you will see at this point, remember since it was 1966, they were still building the Haunted Mansion. And so it says Haunted Mansion future home of 1,001 ghosts. Now, anybody who knows the Haunted Mansion knows it's 999 happy haunts with room for 1,000, right? Any volunteers? So, any volunteers? So where do we get 1,001? Well, that is actually a reference to a very popular book called 1,001 Arabian Nights. Um, and so they just kind of work that into their language as they were talking about the Haunted Mansion, and they assumed it would be 1001. And it wasn't until later that the script was changed to include kind of the gag of 999, and then you could be the one for the 1000, right? Mm. So the interesting thing about 1001 Arabian Nights was also the book that they used to base the movie Aladdin. So it's kind of an unexpected connection there to the movie Aladdin. Arabian well. Nights. Then I have one last little tidbit about the Haunted Mansion before we uh, move on to your third story is uh, I, I kind of hinted. I think I told you a little bit about this, Kirk, when I was last time I was uh, in Disney World like two days ago, three days ago, two days ago. Um, so Yesterday. There, yeah, I don't know. It's not that long ago. So we've talked about Aunt Lucretia before. She is this very handsome woman who shows up as the uh bust that will follow you in the portrait gallery, right? You're the eyes follow you. So they look like they turn and they follow you, which we've talked about before is kind of like a, a, a concave idea and it's illuminated from behind. Here's a picture of what it looks like kind of behind the scenes there. So you're seeing the the hollowed out inside, so to speak, of the mask where oh, and it's illuminated from the other side. And that's why it looks like it follows you. But there's something that I found that was a patent from 1995 where guests would have posed for a photo. Here, here's the patent here. They would have posed for a photo, um, maybe after the ride um, or in a specific area. And then they would print the photo on a thin sheet of plastic, and then it would be heated and vacuum formed over a generic face and then trimmed. 
So the result would be a life-size mask with your face on it that you could use to make a Lucretia effect of your own, uh, featuring your own face. So you could put that on your mantle. Cool. Yeah, like your own face. And as you walk across the room, it would follow you. <laughs> so obviously... We never got this, but that was a patent. That, and this happens a lot with Disney. They'll patent something that they're thinking about doing and then just so that they have the patent in place and then they don't end up using it. Um, but, but another idea that they, they did also put a patent out here for is the idea of um, giving the, the busts that are in the Haunted Mansion projected faces. So um, this was a revived Gracie um, Crump kind of experiment that they were doing Um Here's just a little bit of the their drawings from that um, turning mask. But the, basically, they would have had projectors inside the wall rather than a simple light bulb. So instead of just illuminating it, they would actually have projectors. And they would add moving eyes and maybe limited animation with the mouths and eyebrows of Lucretia and her friend kind of like um, doing things. And the really cool part about this, though, is that they could have added audio and then made them talk. So they could have talked that to you. That would have been cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I don't know. It, you have to think about, does this work for, would they be allowed to do this before um, Madame Leota, right? Because it is, a, yeah. are, are they allowed to be animated before that? And maybe that's one of the reasons they dropped it as an idea, because it's too soon for the ghost to be materializing, so to speak. Um. But yeah, the just a little few little Aunt Lucretia facts because she's one of my favorite characters from the Haunted Mansion. She does not get enough love. Nobody knows she's there. She shows up multiple times. She she's always there for you. And nobody knows her. Nobody understands. They all think she's a man. <laughs> does she? Have, all right, ready. This is might be one of those weird things where like you think you see it, but maybe it doesn't exist. Does she have a brooch on? Um, I feel like she does. Yeah. It's one of those things where I'm, I just, I'm thinking about it going like, what does that bridge does. say? Does it not have anything? I don't know if it has anything, but I'd have to look up some pictures and find out. Yeah. But here's also another picture of what it looks like behind the scenes, which is pretty fun. Oh, cool. So, yeah. mold that's my, my little, uh, yeah, we could have had our own Lucretia faces. Yeah. I think that would have totally been safe. You just have like a guest come in here and they go. <laughs> <laughs> it was all done with a photo. So it was like safe. It was like the face, the molds were not the people. <laughs> so anyway, that's my third obscure story. Is I like that. That's cool. Alrighty. What's your third story? I'm ready. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Or, as I say, uh, down here in Florida, evaporative snow. <laughs> Fun fact, most people down here love the fact that it snows in Florida. But it really doesn't snow. It snoops. But Snope isn't a trademarked name. That's just something that guests who have been going to Walt Disney World have called it. But Snope is actually evaporative snow. And you might wonder, you know, when did they start blowing this sudsy nonsense around? Great question. <laughs> Let's look at the history of evaporative snow. Oh, so, I'm excited. Um, yeah. I'm excited for this. See, this is, this is, a, good, this is a good one. <laughs> I think you'll, you'll like this part. So prior to this, making snow, like fake snow, was mainly done in um, theatrical performances. And here is a Christmas film from 1946. It's a Wonderful Life. And filled in this can is, uh, it was made out of cornflakes. <laughs> it was, corn no, flakes. it was made out of cornflakes painted. So, the but the problem with using cornflakes is the crunch noise. So when you would be stepping around these flakes, it would be so loud that a lot of times they would have to redub any of the snow-filled scenes because it was so loud afterwards. So in It's a Wonderful Life, if you look at the scenes where they are crunching around on cornflakes that are painted white, that's all redubbed audio. 
It's oh not my the gosh. authentic original audio. Come on. That's so interesting. It's a cool one, right? That is so cool. Yeah. See, so I always get one, kids. They're not, it doesn't happen <laughs> all the time, but you, I always get one. You do. Um, okay. So okay. it wasn't until the 1990s that the Francisco Guerrero's company, uh, Snowmasters, started making a an alternative. Uh, and you're correct that Snope or evaporative snow as the trademark name is uh it started uh to to be made to make a an effect and he was a magician so francisco guerrera was a magician and in his magic shows he would make it snow and the way he made it snow was using thousands of tiny bubbles and it was a very rudimentary machine and in fact the very first machines were called out of all things T-1000s. I don't know if you guys are, uh, if you remember any of the Terminator series, but this is what they looked like. This was the very first type of snow machines, the T-1000s. David Copperfield used them. So it was mainly sold to magicians, but then Steve Zygmunt of Magical Effects licensed it and used the technology, enhanced it to the point where uh, theme parks wanted to use it. Now, what's crazy is that there really are only three companies that make uh, Snope, but uh, the only ones that Disney uses are the evaporative snow from Global Special Effects. Here is a giant 55-gallon drum. It costs you $16,720. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But it's got a three-year shelf life. What's crazy is this stuff's non-toxic, doesn't slip, it's biodegradable, and lasts anywhere between 30 and 60 seconds uh, for evaporative snow. When they first started out using these systems, they, they sold them into Disney first, and Main Street USA were the first people to use it, and they had 72 T-1000s to do their snow events in the early 2000s all the way until 2009, but now they have upgraded and you've seen, so these are the old machines. These are the T-1000s. They now use uh, new machines that are called uh, T, I think it's T-1500s. Hang on. Enhance. And you, you can actually see these in motion, not only in the Frozen show, but if you go to uh, Sunset Boulevard, and Hollywood Studios at night, you can actually see these machines pumping out, and you'll see suds on the nozzle of these things. To put these in, into perspective, you can get these around anywhere between used ones for about sixteen hundred, all the way to brand new ones for somewhere around six grand, depending on which model and whatnot that you put out. But these things put out thousands and thousands of tiny little bubbles. Um, yeah, is it? I just think it's it's fascinating, and they they've been using the same exact company since the '90s, and they just own pretty much the same machines that they have since 2009 to make Snope everywhere, wow. and everyone uses them. Every this is like they're the people. If you want to make it, you go to Global Special Effects and get your Snope or evaporative snow. Yeah, we're all gonna call it Snope though. That's <laughs> Not me. Let's be honest. I'm bringing it back. <laughs> Make well, evaporative I, snope fun. You know, it makes more sense, though, knowing the cost of it, that why they don't just kind of have it like constantly, because it would be so much like I would love it to just kind of continuously snow on on Main Street USA on Sunset Boulevard. But they only have it like intermittently and only for like two to three minutes max, you know, and then it's like it's done. Well, you know, they say non-slippery, but I've actually been to places where they've, like, put them on for way too long. Sesame Place was like that. And I remember, like, it's it's soap, you know? Like, eventually, yeah. too much is too much. And you will have, like, people slide all over. I don't know if it's so much of a price thing, to be honest with you. Because if you look at the reservoirs at uh, the Frozen shows, in the beginning of the day, they're all the way filled. And at the end of the day, like they're small reservoirs. They're not that much. It's like that 55 gallon drum probably fills every single snope machine on property. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's probably like that, that like what it maybe maybe they use only one a day 
for half a barrel a day. It's not that much. Well, it's you know? kind of like bubbles, you know, it's like if you if you inject air into it, it's going to those bubbles can go pretty far and pretty long. Yeah, yeah, because uh, your ends, I'm not sure 100 percent if these things like if that's a concentrate that you dilute, because if that's a concentrate that you dilute, then you would get even more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's so interesting. So, yeah. Uh, that it's a wonderful life thing now, though. Uh, now I want to go watch it up. that movie. Crunch it up. <laughs> that had to happen a lot in those old movies too. There's so many of them. Mm-hmm. Now I'm gonna be staring at the snow and listening intently. <laughs> Do I hear any cornflakes in this scene? <laughs> I don't know how it would look. You know, like I, I mean, even using something simple like we use it for our uh, like our Dickens Festival like uh, village that we have, and it's just like white felt. I wonder how many times they use something simple like that. I feel like they use that quite a bit too, you know? I know they use that a lot in like Hallmark movies because you've seen yeah. people post about how like they're filming a Hallmark Hallmark movie in their neighborhood and it's all like it's fake just snow felt. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's I, I saw a video of a guy stepping through just felt and it was like there's no footprints or anything because he's just <laughs> stepping on cloth. <laughs> you know they do that in uh haunted mansion holiday like if you look at the snow that they put in the the graveyard scene it's definitely much very much like just fabric that they've looped around things right or uh mm-hmm. rather the batting you know i guess that's what it's called okay hang on time out this is a horse of a different color one gallon so that sixteen thousand seven hundred and twenty dollar fifty five uh gallon drum one gallon gets you 16 gallons of ready use fluid. Wow. Oh, okay. I feel like I feel like you only need like three gallons a season. I feel like we should invest in some and just make it happen. <laughs> what? And just start spraying <laughs> just for stuff. ourselves. You can <laughs> you my, can buy a 35. You can buy an eight ounce. You can buy an yeah. eight ounce container yeah, like- for 35 bucks or a gallon. A gallon's expensive. Gallon's 480, but you'll get 16 gallons of snoop. I, I feel like that if it wasn't possibly going to snow where I live, I would consider that for my kids just to make it a little magical. Sounds fun. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, grab your concentrate while you can kids and make it snow at your house. Well, this has been a really fun episode of random things. <laughs> yeah. That's why it was a potluck. Like we just brought it and uh, it, whether you wanted to consume it or not, you ate. <laughs> Very much a good Thanksgiving special, right? Because you have yeah. all of your favorite Thanksgiving dishes. Now, I think I feel like we can't end this Thanksgiving episode without talking about what is your favorite Thanksgiving dish that you can't live without on Thanksgiving. I can't live without stuffing with lots of gravy on it. Oh, stuffing with gravy. Interesting. Uh, what? I mean, what? I have is that gravy controversial? on my stuffing, but like, no, what? I'm just like, I wouldn't have thought, I don't know, sometimes I don't have gravy on my stuffing, so I never thought what? <laughs> that, am I like a felon? Am no. I committed? No, I just thought it was interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I love mashed potatoes. I love green bean casserole. But if I don't have an uncomfortable amount of stuffing with gravy, I probably would have a problem. Oh, I see like mashed potatoes with gravy or like turkey with gravy, but I guess I don't like always associate like maybe you end up getting a little bit of gravy on your stuffing, but I've never like covered it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh. Yeah. Remember when you that? asked me like what I couldn't live without and then you just were like, well, I couldn't do that. That's it's not about you. Babe. This is my <laughs> stuffing dream. Let me live my, my stuffing best life. I didn't say you life. couldn't. I was just saying it was interesting. I, and, then, and then immediately after you said that, I was like, wait a second. Does nobody else put gravy on their stuffing? Was that like a me thing? Am I the weirdo? Me? <laughs> I just I'm the like, you like, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It's fine. I'll live. I'll live my truth. You know? Do you, wait, hang on. Can I ask? There is a sacrilege for me. Yeah. What's that? Nuts, raisins, or fruit and stuffing. Allowable, unallowable. I mean, I. I it's horrible that you're thinking about this. Well, I make different kinds of stuffing every year. So some say this It's been year... a great episode. Good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I'll do like a, an apple sausage stuffing. Okay, that's fair. So that I feel like that's a good No, 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 no. Okay, okay. 
But like you make like a normal stuffing, and then you make like your fancy one that like a couple yeah, people like, eat. Yeah, like a couple people. Eat. I'm just kidding. Actually, no, that one was really good because it was made with like garlic bread, so it wasn't just. No, like, that sounds up, really like, good. Yeah, it was. It's really good. But this year, Elliot just wanted like a savory stuffing, so I'm just going basic like celery, onions, like chicken oh. broth, the main. <laughs> Speaking my language now. Now talk to me, sis. We're we saying it. I like Elliot's it. like, what's up, garlic? Hashtag garlic bread. The, um, I'm not going to lie. Mel makes a pineapple stuffing. And it's sweet, right? It's And everybody loves it. Like, it's her one thing that everybody wants her to make is pineapple stuffing. And it's it's got, like, cinnamon in it. And it's delicious. Give me gravy and regular stuffing. That's the jam. Stuffing in or out of the bird, Jess... Never cook your stuffing in the no, bird. It's, so it's dangerous. very unhealthy and yeah. it's unsafe. Always cook your stuffing separate. Yeah, for sure. And it takes so much longer to cook too with when it's stuffed. So just like save yourself the hassle. Don't do I remember it. the first time I cooked a turkey, I didn't realize that the neck and organs were in it, like inside <laughs> the bird. So I remember <laughs> no. when I was de-thawing and I'm like, what is this? Whoa. <laughs> It's extra bonus parts. Yeah, you can you can make. Turkey. I mean, I've I've used the neck to make uh, broth before. Yeah, yeah, it's really good for that. Good, good with that. Yeah. I like to make neck broth. <laughs> I like to I like to drink turkey necks in water. That's oil. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm Hot doing. Tail, stick a turkey neck in it. <laughs> Why not? All right. Enough about my uh, neck water. What are you into, Kate? I really, I think the pumpkin pie is my favorite part. And it has to be with Cool Whip because that's how I grew up. And it has to be the Libby's that's not actual pumpkin. It's like the Libby's like butternut can, squash can, yeah, can yeah. pumpkin. Because I've tried, I've made it from scratch from an actual pumpkin that I grew in my yard before. And I've had it with like real whipped cream that I've made from scratch. And I was like, none of this tastes like Thanksgiving. Like it has to be Cool Whip and it has to be Libby's. And yeah. otherwise it's not Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. I love pumpkin pie. I'm with yeah. it. Dude, you know what I do with pumpkin pie? I eat it like a pizza slice. I know this sounds so weird, but like <laughs> later on when you have leftover pumpkin pie, you just cut that bad boy. You don't need a plate. Just hold it up and you just walk around with it. That's what I do. I kind of no eat, eat my, I'm an eat my pie backwards kind of girl though. What? Because, yeah. Crust first? Yeah. You're an I don't animal. Do it with pizza. I don't do it with pizza. There are just... rules, Kate. <laughs> Because the cr the crust is like my least favorite part, so I get it over with first. That I have to eat it. <laughs> and I do eat what rest. everyone else on planet Earth does. You leave that sucker on the plate. Forget about it. You just you don't eat. You don't eat it. I feel it. guilty. I harbor guilt from that. My plate is not clean, and I can't. Let that crust go, girl. You know. <laughs> Maybe this will be the year. This is the year I get I don't over my. <laughs> I don't like the crust, so I eat it first. It's not like vegetables. <laughs> like it's okay to not eat and finish your dessert. Don't eat the, the bad parts. You but know? I made it, you know, and the girls made it with me usually, and so it's like it's a it's a feel guilty not eating it. It's like they they did the little finger press thing all the way around, and so you feel like you have to. How about teach them how to make crust that's good that you want to eat? My crust is not bad. <laughs> to you, it's the worst part. I just don't like the crust in general. Like, I would make a crustless pie if I could. Be I'm not, well, what about changing it up? Why don't you change it up? Why don't you do a different style crust versus like a traditional one? Pumpkin pie. Okay. It's just not the same. And it's not, it's not as pretty. You need a good photo, you know? You know what always weirded me out is uh, in Sleigh Ride where they're like, they talk about, uh, <laughs> we'll tell ghost stories and tales of the glory. So I'm like, wait. Tell ghost stories and tales <laughs> of the glory of Christmases long ago. I mean, what was happening in these Christmases? And then they're like, at one part, they're like, and we pass around the pumpkin pie. And I'm like, I've never had pumpkin pie for Christmas. When did it become synonymous with Thanksgiving and not Christmas? Well, like, turkey. or does everybody have turkey pumpkin like pie for Christmas, Christmas? Christmas food, right? Like, it was, what was? A, a turkey. It was like, it's a, and a lot of people still have turkey on Christmas. We do a ham. We're a ham. I was thought, family. yeah, I thought a lot of people did ham. But there's we there's don't... a lot of turkey families out there for Christmas. Oh, it's a thing. Okay. Well, we don't do, they have we it do in like lamb? Uh, a, a, a Christmas Carol. Don't they get a giant turkey for that? They get, they do, like, yeah, make they do. Icky slicing his turkey. 
And even even in National Lampoons, he's carving into a turkey that just like who's <laughs> up. <It's> like, <laughs> Save the neck for me, Clark. <laughs> I love that movie. It's a good one. Well, okay. Well, we've learned that I eat my pie wrong and you have an obsession with gravy, so good times. <laughs> If uh, I'll say it, I'll say it. <laughs> oh, see, there's lots of people that are saying they do turkey and for Christmas. See, yeah, it's a thing. That's it's not a thing for totally it. Cool. It's a thing. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Distry. We had fun talking about six obscure Disney stories that we are thankful for this evening. Uh, thanks for coming along on this little adventure. <laughs> we didn't really know what to expect with this one, but. Just like a Thanksgiving dinner, we did have many sides for you to choose from, whichever one was your favorite. Kirk, do you have any final thoughts as we wrap up here? When I was at IAPA, Holiday World unleashed to the world a new gravy boat roller coaster train, proving, and it's called Good Gravy, proving that everything is better, even roller coasters with gravy. Okay. All right. That's why you saved it. I get it now. Okay. I never have anything for this part. Don't point that out. <laughs> All righty. Well, we really appreciate you guys hanging out with us for this very special Thanksgiving episode. And uh, next time we will be back for Distory and we'll dive into the history of the Jingle Cruise. So that's coming up right around the corner. So thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Distory. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye buddy. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>